Hi everyone, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. We're so happy you're here. Our little scripture study class. <laughs> Finally, Grace is part of the intro now. <laughs> She's earned her spot to be able to say I'm growing up. What, I'm it growing is up. That, what it is that we're doing. Uh, we're moving through the Book of Mormon, if it's your first time, um, talking about things that we think you don't want to miss. And today we're in Mosiah 18 to 24. So we're so excited to just jump in. And this title, by the way, comes from a little message at the very end. Today's a story of deliverance and how that might look a little bit differently in different people's lives. We only get two examples today, but I just think it's cool that they are different from each other because it just shows you that God is a deliverer, but that deliverance might come in different ways. And, uh, and he knows best. Why? Right? Because I think even the style of deliverance speaks to his heart. There must be a reason why he delivered this group differently from this group. It wasn't random. There was something about what that style of deliverance was going to do for their soul, that that's why God did it the way that he did. And that he can work in different ways for different people. Yes. That while two people needed deliverance, he looked at both and said, I can do this in the exact perfect way for you. Right, right. So having those two stories back to back right next to each other, I think teaches us a lot about um, his character and also teaches us that um, as we're expecting and pleading and praying for deliverance to know God is a deliverer, but it just might come a little bit differently. Mm. All right. You know, I love timelines, y'all. So <laughs> it's like we've seen this timeline eight times <laughs> and you're finally getting it. Okay. So you remember, this is what's been going on. We've had up in the land of Zarahemla, King Mosiah, King Benjamin, and King Mosiah. And you remember during that first reign of King Mosiah, the very first one, that group Zenith leaves and they go down to the land of, um, land of Nephi. So they're living down here. And these two stories, you remember, have been happening at the same time, but we didn't know about it until Mosiah sends Ammon down to the people of Limhi. And then they've been telling us the flashback story. So we heard about Zenith two times ago. We heard about Noah and Abinadi last week. And during that story of Noah and Abinadi, what happens is, remember, Alma breaks away, but there was one. Remember, it just that one man made a big difference, Alma. And he breaks off of King Noah. And now we're going to kind of get these two different stories. One of them is going to be Alma's story. They broke off from them and went off on their own. We'll get their story. And then we're also going to get the end of Limhi's story up here. So they live out in the woods or whatever, you know, <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then at the end, spoiler alert, they're all going to come together back up to the land of Zarahemla with Mosiah the second. So 18 starts with Alma's story. Uh, one thing that I was so impressed by is that three times in this first column of scripture in chapter 18, it gives you a word that distinguishes what is common among all of these people. So this for real is the then, best chapter in the whole book of Mormon. I'm sorry, I have to say it before I'm we even so start. I'm so glad that you said it. Because, because it really is true. Even yeah. right when you just started saying that, I just was like... 18. Was that 18? You guys, it's it. it is, wins. We're crowning it. The Olympics are coming. <laughs> <laughs> cool, let's go ahead and give it the gold medal. Yeah. A favorite. Um, it's winning me. He started to... And just the fact that it starts... Actually, let me just start with one. Verse one. And now it came to pass, Alma, who had fled from the servants of King Noah repented of his sins and iniquities and went about privately to teach the people and began to teach the words of Abinadi. This is such a great second chance story. Alma becomes such a influential leader for good. And that's not the way that his story started. Interestingly, his son's going to have a really similar story as well. And it just gives a lot of hope for whatever that first half of your life looked like. The second half of your life doesn't have to look like that as well. Well, and I love the fact that him and Abinadi did things very differently. They were two very different people. Abinadi showed up and he said, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to do this loudly. I'm going to pretend to have a disguise and I don't even need it because I'm just going to go for it 100%. And I love that Alma starts his and he says, no, I'm going to do this privately. And the thing is, it wasn't like one of them was doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. One of them wasn't preaching the gospel in the wrong way. Yeah. God just needed them for different things. Yeah. And Alma wouldn't have been able to teach privately if Abinadi wasn't speaking boldly. And the rest of the Book of Mormon wouldn't be the same if Alma wasn't willing to start 
quietly. Makes me think of a letter that I got from Jack where he's talking about, Jack was a missionary in Florida for six months before he went to Mozambique. And he just made this discovery, which I just love so much, where he just said, Dad, but that doesn't work in Mozambique. It's not the way that they think. It's not the way that they connect with the gospel. Mm. And how he's learning, he's got to change the way he taught people in Florida to a very different style, teaching people in Mozambique. It's the same gospel. He's still a servant of the Lord, but he's discovering, hold on, there are different ways. God has a, there's this quote from this rabbi I love so much where he just said, if um, God relates to his children and all their diversity, there must be diverse ways of relating to him. Mm, and I think beautiful. that you're, you're seeing that here. And I love in verse two, he teaches the resurrection and the redemption. Those are the two things that he wants to teach. And maybe repentance. You could add that third R in there from verse one and make that really fun. But circle this word three times. In verse three, it says, and many did believe his words. And then in verse four, the, as many as did believe did go forth to this place called Mormon. And then again in verse six, it came to pass that as many as believed him went to hear the words. And then in the middle of seven, yea, all were gathered together that believed. And I wrote my margin here, I love that believers is a name for this gathering. Makes mm. me want every Sunday morning when I walk into church to just call, call that meeting like believers. That's the reason everybody is gathered together. The one thing that everyone in that chapel has in common is that they believe and they're here um, because of their belief. And I just, I, I'm really into that word of believing. I wish we said it more. You know, and maybe we do. But. Well, and that's the only thing that he figured was important to mention about the people. Right. I think that's really cool that he yeah. didn't. He didn't say, "Oh, we had these super rich people, and then there was also these type of people, and there was this type of people, and that type of people." But it was just, "Oh no, we're all together," and that's the most important thing is that we all believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, that word "believe" comes from German. That the prefix for "be" means fully. So, like, if you hear the word beloved, that means fully loved is where that comes from. Do you know this word, leave? If any of you speak German, lieb means the heart. So, to believe means with full heart. Mm. That's what that word means. And then he starts talking about what it looks like to live the life of a believer. And he starts to ask these questions in verse 8. Um, the questions about their desires. And I really think it's important that this is about somebody's desires because desires always come before our actions. Um, they're what spark and fuel our actions. And sometimes even he's going to use the word willing in here so much. And, and I think that's really important to understand. It's like, oh, that a desire is important. Sometimes we don't fall. We should, we want to, but sometimes we don't follow through on our desires, we do them clumsily, we forget, we get scared. And I think it's important to remember that the Lord loves a willing heart, the Lord loves a heart that desires good. Eventually that's gonna lead into practice and we want it to lead into practice, but I just think I like that God acknowledges desire and that God acknowledges willingness. So I made this little list on the board and you can just read it in here. You, I put numbers in my margins, things to mark. And he's like, if you're desirous to, one, come into the fold of God, two, be called his people. He's asking him, is this what you want? Do you want to be a part of the good shepherd's fold? Be under his care? Do you want to be called his are you willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be like? There's, there's that first time willing shows up. Shows up every week in the sacrament prayer. And I think that's so important because I think we can get down on ourselves when we're just like, oh no, I don't bear other people's burdens very well. Mm. Well, take a step back and ask yourself, but are you willing to? You know, you're just like, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And that's okay. Maybe learn how. But at least, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it gets like, yeah. You can practice and that's yeah, fine. Right. But as long as you're willing. Yeah. Like, I think you ought to, oh, I am. I, and I'm not trying to use that as an excuse. It's like, well, I'm willing, check the box. But I just, for those who get down on themselves about not being very good at this yet, um, willing to bear one another's burdens, willing to mourn with those who mourn, willing to comfort those who stand in need of comfort. If you're willing to stand as a witness of God in all times and in all places and in all things that you may be in. And you know what I've always thought about this phrase, to this about witnessing of God at all times and all places and all things, is not so much like bearing testimony that like God lives or God is real, but 
you actually get to be a living, walking, talking witness of what God can do in a life. Mm. And I think that's a really powerful way to be a witness. Well, and I don't know if you're going to say this, so sorry if you are. You can just cut me off. But it's one of my favorite parts about this whole entire verse is that he says, even until death. And I think when we read that, we just think of like our whole entire life. Like we're like, oh, for my whole life, I'll do that. But when he was talking to those people and he said, even until death, they would still have the memory of Abinadi in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And that would have meant something different to them. Mm. And then all of a sudden when he says, listen, you're going to need to be willing to wear God's name on your heart for your, like wherever you are, whether you are in the king's court in front of a council or whether you are with your family or whether you are at school, wherever you are, even until death. And I don't think that they thought like long lasting. I think that in that moment it said, do you care enough about this that if your life was on the line, you'd still stand with it? Mm. And I love that when they had to like think about that, they didn't have to be the first one to say yes because they had an example of someone that was. Yeah. And they'd look and say, this was something that Abinadi was worth, like thought was worth sacrificing his own life for. Yeah. And if it's that important to him, then of course I want to care about it. Yeah, and I love I love that line that you just said, by the way, about where do you want to wear that name of God on, you know, your heart? You know this because you were a missionary, and this is so common with so many missionaries. That w- why is it so difficult to take your name tag off? Mm. Because you become so endeared to. I I was proud, in the most righteous sense. Everybody, <laughs> I was proud to wear his name. Like, it, I, I, was, I, I was thrilled to tell his story. And I like that this whole part started with those, you know, redemption and resurrection and ascension and repentance. Like, I'm, I, I'm not, I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I don't know somebody who would be because his message is so sweet and it's so welcoming and it's so good. I just can't, like, he never would have had a bad PR campaign. <laughs> like, you know, what was it about his life? And, and so when he asks him, like, do you want to come into his fold and be called his people? And you can, you can just see the people like itching. Like, yes. And he's like, and don't you want to live in a community where we help each other out? Mm. Where we mourn with people who are mourning? Where we comfort people who are comforting? Don't you want to stand as a witness of what God can do individually and in a congregation? At all times. Sometimes um, I will cross out even until death. And I just write in my margins, even until the end of the day. Because that feels a little bit like, okay, I can do this today, you know, type of thing. And do you want to be redeemed? <laughs> yes. Do you want to be yes. numbered? No, David answering. <laughs> yes. I'm yes. getting excited. I'm getting excited. Do you want to live eternal life? Now, I say unto you, if this be the desire of your hearts, all of verse 8 and 9, What have you against being baptized in the name of the Lord as a way to witness before him that you want to do life together with him? That's what it means that you've entered into a covenant. I am baptized as a way to say to God and say to pledge to everyone there, I need God's help in my life. And I would like to do it side by side with you. So as a witness to you to tell you that is the desire of my heart, I would like to be baptized And go down into the water with you and come out in new life with you. And I want to serve you and do your cause and and keep your commandments with all my life. And then I've circled this word that. Because why? So that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you. I um, I heard that a couple times in this last conference. I love finding that in scriptures here. That I've always believed that that one of the purposes of ordinances is that we and covenants is we show our agency. Um, we say yes to God being more abundant in our lives. The God's going to move and work in everybody's life. But um, he's also a gentleman and won't pr- press and push. But we can use our agency and, say, and open the door to him and say, I would like you to pour out your abundant spirit and goodness and grace on my life. I would like to live more abundantly with the with um, mm. the Holy Spirit. And then verse 11 is my favorite verse in all the world because hmm. it says, and now when the people had heard these words, they clapped their hands for joy and exclaimed, this is the desire of our hearts. I just have always believed if someone teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ correctly, the freedom from sin and death, 
made possible by his great atoning sacrifice, the potential for the abundant life a person can live. If it's taught correctly, it will lead people to clap their hands, to tie up their dancing shoes, to stand all amazed. That is what the message leads a heart to do. You know, just to like, oh. And and this is why I'm going to start clapping in church. Bishop, if you are scripture. listening, I am going to scripturally start. I have scriptural precedence to begin to clap in church. You know, sometimes your spirit just has to. And and then they do. They go down into the waters together to be to be baptized. And um, don't you love this chapter? It's so good. I'm not, I like just interrupting myself. <laughs> I know, because, because how? This is a description of what it looks like to live as a believer. Mm. And it makes me want to be a believer. I want to live my life like this. And it's so interesting because I think sometimes when we talk about living the life of a believer, we act like it seems so hard. And we're like, oh, there's so much to do and it feels so exhausting. And I'm like, yeah, some days are really going to be exhausting. That's just the truth. But when they heard about the life of a believer, they clapped. Right. They couldn't even wait. Like, it's right. not even like they could even think about it. Like, they gave a standing ovation because they couldn't sit in their seats any longer because right. they wanted to be a part of it. I know. And I'm like, you're, if that doesn't, if the thrill of the life of a believer doesn't make you stand up and clap, you might be learning about the wrong. Like, you might be missing it. Yeah. You're hearing the wrong message. You've got the, the wrong story of Jesus. Yeah. Mortality is hard. God's not hard. Mortality is hard. And he's come into mortality to rescue us and strengthen us through mortality. That's the good news of the gospel, right? Life is lifey, you know? And Jesus says, I can teach you how to do it abundantly. Life I, is lifey. It really it, it it is. is crazy. <laughs> and I do love this part. And I don't know why it's happening, everybody. So I'm just going to, it's going to be fine. But in 12, Alma took Helam, one of the first, and he went and stood in the water and cried, saying, O Lord, pour out thy spirit upon thy servant, that he may do his work, do this work with holiness of heart. Someone print that prayer out. Someone pray that prayer every morning. In fact, it's one I'm going to send to Jack. And I'm going to say, start your day with this prayer. Mm -hmm. O Lord, pour out thy spirit upon thy servant, that he may do this work. With holiness of, of heart, you know? Every mom, pray that prayer in the morning. Every, every friend, everyone. And then when he had said these words, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he said, Heal him, I baptize you, having authority from Almighty God, as a testimony that you've entered into a covenant to serve him until you are dead. <laughs> and this adds to this mortal body, because you'll live forever and ever. And may the Spirit of the Lord be poured out upon you. Poured is the theme of this, by the way. Mm. We do not believe in a God who like sprinkles blessings for the record. He pours it out and he says that he may grant unto you eternal life through the redemption of Christ who has prepared from the, this is a great baptismal prayer. We might, we might really want to consider like, (laughs) you know. David, can't believe it while you're reading it. You're like, hey, wait a minute. This is really good. We've shortened our prayer probably because like we've got to get the words right or something, but like, it would take too long, but like, oh man, oh man, this is the intention behind the baptismal <laughs> prayer, just so you know. And then I love this part and somebody in here is going to probably say why, you know, with authority, priesthood authority or something like this, why it happened. But I just like the imagery of the fact that they were buried in the water and they arose and came out of the water rejoicing, being filled with the spirit. Mm. I like the imagery of a, a, a community of believers does this together right? That they're buried in their promises together and they come forth out to do this work together. Hmm. And just so you know, that that's just truly only the first half of, oh, and we did is, forget about it. Let me put this in. Which is the word of the week, this idea of a covenant. That it's a covenant promise that we make with God. You know, um, the, what we just described is what it looks like to live that covenant life, to live that believer's life. And this would be a, a message I would teach. Um, my kids in in my home for the week they get to see this word, you know? And don't you love this? this, this, Did you read this one? Yeah. Wait. Every part of this. Listen, everybody. A coming together to bind oneself, a solemn agreement between members of a church that they'll walk together according to the precepts of the gospel in brotherly affection. Excuse you. That's I, I like a part of a... 
I think we talk about covenants so individually. It's my covenants that I've made with God. Mm. I like that this chapter in particular, Restored Christianity, um, the promise of Elijah is, is bigger. It's more about like, wait, covenantal promises have a lot more to do with community with a community of believers. And I think that's just, it's so beautiful. Within covenant, within the word covenant are the two great commandments, to love God and also to love people, to do this life together with him and with others. Mm, Beautiful. Okay, so I don't want to... Never mind. Yeah. Oh, we, okay. we just need to go on. Let's go, go on okay. to the next. <laughs> okay. Just We're just going to stay. We just only do this. Yeah. Part of Let me clap whole. my hands again and again. Um, the next day's reading is the second half of Mosiah 18. And just so you know, it's just as good. And that's the problem is that why is this the best chapter in the whole entire Book of Mormon? It's just simply true. And what happens is he goes through and Alma's teaching a people that have lived in a kingdom before. But it feels like this next part of the chapter is then like is Alma teaching them how to live in a new kind of kingdom and yeah. his kingdom. Because what's going to happen is he's going to say, listen, we're not going to fight with each other. That's not how this place works. That's not how this kingdom works. There's no contention. Yeah. And pause. Let's just give this example like or teaching suggestion or study suggestion is what if 18 was a description of living in a kingdom of believers, living Way in a cool. community of faith. What do you find in chapter 18 that, that teaches that? would be a really cool individual study. That could be a great like class study also. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry. But I no, just that's that. really cool. I thought it was a good idea. Yeah. And um, he goes through and he's going to say, listen, you might be used to living in a kingdom that cares more about like what's happening with other people and fighting because you want to be better them, than them or you feel worse than them. So you're trying to like out show them. But that's not how this works. We are all together now. We have one faith, one baptism, which I think is really cool thinking about that word covenant, that you're walking together. We are in the same covenant. We yeah. all made the same covenant. We're doing this together. Yeah. And you know what? I don't think we emphasize a ton. I'm coming back to that idea again, but... When we are baptized, we are making a covenant promise with God, but we're also entering into the kingdom. It's the entrance into the kingdom. And a kingdom is a group of people. It's the family. And so I, I think we're seeing that in this chapter, a lot of that emphasis on kingdom life. Well, even that covenant talks about... Yeah, how to live it. Your, the yeah. promises you make with God are... Look, this is how you treat others. This, this is, is what the kingdom others. looks like. Yes. It's not the kingdom by yourself. Right. You cannot have a kingdom without the rest of you. Yeah. And he says, you have to live together and you have to live every single day. This is the cutest part in verse 23. And when he talked about the Sabbath, he's like, okay, keep that holy. But also don't just worry about the Sabbath. Worry about every day. Give mm-hmm. thanks to the Lord, their God, every single day. You can make sure that you do it on that day and keep that holy. But that look, he's not just a Sunday God. Mm. He is a God that mm. will show up on Monday and Wednesday and Thursday. And in the middle of the day on Saturday, he will be there. And don't forget about him just because it's not the Sabbath. This is your life, not just one day. Mm-hmm. And then he goes and he says, listen, It doesn't matter who you are. You are going to work for each other. We're all in this together. It doesn't matter what your title is. You are going to work with your own hands. You will help every single person. You are there in the middle of them. And then he goes through and he says, listen, we're going to gather together. We're not doing this by ourselves. Your covenant is not just you. It is us. We're doing this all together. We're going to figure this out all together. And then he's going to go through and he says, listen, You might be used to a kingdom where your work goes to one person to support them and their favorite people, but not here. That's not how this is going to go. The priests, this is verse 26, the priests were not to depend upon the people for their support, but really they're going to work and we are all going to do this together. We are going to experience grace together. We are going to experience the spirit together. All of us are trying to learn and gain knowledge of God together. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your position is. All of us are trying to be better every single day. So you've got to do that with us. And he says, listen, it doesn't matter how much you have or how little you have. We're giving this together. This is the kingdom. And I love that that's how it looks. That he says, look around. This is the kingdom of God. And it might be different than the kingdom you're used to. But it had to have been something so appealing that it was worth going to the middle of the forest for 
And I think it's so interesting because at the beginning of verse 18, it says where they went, at the beginning of chapter 18, it says where they went in verse four, and it's the borders of the land. And just so you know, it's the place that has been infested by times or at seasons by wild beasts. That's where Alma had to go. And when you think about it, he is hiding. He's going into hiding to teach these people. Right. You are not going somewhere beautiful. That's Where just it's the truth. Be obvious. Yeah, you're yeah. not going to a vacation resort because well, think about the saints. The, you the, came out to the desert. You're yeah, going it's to hide. like you're going to the place <laughs> that no one else wants to go. That's the point of hiding. That's yeah. where you are going, and it's infested with beasts and in the middle of nowhere, and no one wants to go there. And someone's got to do that painting because normally when we see the waters of Mormon, it's they, so beautiful. I like look at them and I was like, I want to get baptized there. <laughs> like yeah. I'm gonna go get baptized again. There's no beasts in the pictures. That's the truth. <laughs> we need <laughs> like, beasts. We need something that looks like the border. We need something that looks like, and I noticed this when I was reading this the other day, verse four. Did you, did, have you ever noticed this before? Okay, we went, this is verse four. We went forth to a place which was called Mormon, having received its name from the king. Is it interesting that Noah is the one who, I'm yeah. thinking it's Noah because he's the king of the time, yeah. who named it Mormon? We all got that name. The from book. Noah? <laughs> We're like, wait. From Noah. Okay, but I think what you're about to teach, like this is also Which makes part it of it. Cool. Yes, yes. Now, now I know where you're going. Okay, so. then you finish that thought then because otherwise people are going to be like, I don't want to be named by King Noah. Yeah, but then you yeah. check it. And what happens is um, verse number 30, you guys, everyone's going to want to talk about this verse. I already know. It's okay. Everyone can because it is truly the best verse in the whole entire Book of Mormon. It is my all-time number one favorite of my entire life. And I feel extra special because it's mine. And then I told my mission president that when I was on my mission. And he said, mine too. And then Aww, I was like, "Oh, that's sweet." He said, you were meant to be my mission president. <laughs> and what happens is he starts describing the place. And it's so funny because it's verse number 30. And when he says it, he says, now it came to pass that all this was done in Mormon. And just so you know, the sentence could have ended there. It was done in Mormon. But then he keeps going, yea, by the waters of Mormon, in the forest that was near the waters of Mormon, yea, the place of Mormon, the waters of Mormon, the forest of Mormon. And you're like, why do you have to say that 18 times? We've got it. Like, you don't need to give us the exact map. You already said it was Mormon. You don't need to describe Mormon to us. Except for the next verse tells you why. Because Mormon was obviously a place that no one cared about, no one wanted to go, was infested with beasts, a disaster. Except for, Mormon was different for these people. Mm -hmm. The waters of Mormon was different for these people. And how beautiful were those places to the eyes of them who there came to the knowledge of their Redeemer. Yea, and how blessed are they, for they shall sing to his praise forever. Because while everyone else in that kingdom might have said that Mormon was the cut and the worst part and somewhere you would never want to find yourself, to them, it was the most beautiful place on earth. Yeah. To them, it was heaven. Mm -hmm. To them, it was everything that they could have ever possibly cared about. And it's just because that's where they met Jesus. And I love the fact that in chapter 18, he's going to say, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. And the place that was the kingdom of God was the worst place in the whole land. Mm. And it was the most insignificant place in the whole land. And I love that he's showing it does not matter where you are. And it does not matter what your house looks like or the neighborhood. And it doesn't matter where you are. What matters is the people you are with and what you are talking about. Yeah. And if you are meeting Jesus there, it will be the most beautiful place in the world to you. And I have in my, um, my other Book of Mormon, this is like my this year Book of Mormon, but in my like life Book of Mormon, I have along this entire page now, it started out with just one place. Um, I just have addresses that fill my entire page of this, page 183 in the Book of Mormon, of all of the places that might be ugly to some people, but have become beautiful to me because I've met Jesus there. And it looks like the address of um, this skate park in the middle of Sacramento. And it looks like the seminary building I used to teach at. And it looks like one apartment, apartment five that I lived in in Provo. And it has all of these addresses because it doesn't really matter where they are. It just matters who you're there with.
Yeah. And what you learn about. That's awesome because I have the same thing in my margins. There's I different know. like different places. And what an awesome thing to talk about. Where are your waters of Mormon? Where are those places that become beautiful because that's where you met Jesus. And even if it's named by a wicked king, even if it started out, like Jesus can come into people's stories and he can change them. We see yeah. that with Alma. So I like that it's just like, yeah, and like it, it just was named by this terrible king. You know, I don't want to be associated with it, but even Jesus can take something like that. Like he's taken the city of Jerusalem, which has just been this war-torn place for centuries. But why, when you book a trip there, do you say the Holy Land? Mm. Right? There was nothing holy about its history except one man came and one act of love changed everything for that place, for those people. For And, and we see this all throughout scripture, don't we? Like for, for a um, scared Jewish mother, a stable became heaven. For a little farm boy, a backyard he now calls sacred. And for these people, this on the bordered land of beasts now becomes beautiful, all because Jesus came into that place in that story. Mm. Th- this is just, this memorize this whole chapter, everybody. Um, or I don't know what. <laughs> I have no threats. Said, okay, well, we have a lot to do. We have a lot of work to do, everyone. Um, 19 through 20, these are sort of chap- uh, story chapters where you get the continuation of the story. And a couple of lessons I want to point out from these two. Uh, um, I, I, uh, what happens in these spots is, well, first let me introduce you to a man whose name is Gideon and verse 4, a strong man who was an enemy to the king. And for all intents and purposes, can we just say an enemy to unrighteousness? Somebody who decided, like Abinadi, to stand up against him. And maybe he got that courage from Abinadi. Maybe he saw, I want to live my life like you. I want to use my strength. I want to use my gifts to stand up against things that are wrong, against injustice. And I want to do something about it. And thank God for people like that who can lead a cause. And mm. Gideon stands up against that king and, and he's chasing the king and the king sees the Lamanites are coming and, and this, is, this is all of chapter 19 story. And he says, we gotta run, Gideon, don't kill me. And, and Gideon doesn't really believe him, but he spares his life for the sake of the people. And so the people, he's sta- t- all the people are running from the Lamanites. And then you get the spot where the king, uh, Noah says to all the men, leave your wives and leave your children. And in verse 12, I am happy that there is a group of them who said, no, that's too far. We've followed you into some pretty deep muck, but you've crossed a line for us mm. and they don't. But some people do. And it's another evidence of how blinded they are. Can you even imagine running for your lives and then dropping the hand of your wife and your kids and leaving him behind to follow this man. And you're just like, they are going to have an awakening moment at the end of chapter 19. And, uh, and it's, and it's going to be painful to their hearts. And this is why God sends Gideons. This is why God sends Abinadites. Because those awakening moments can be so heartbreaking. And he's trying to prevent them from us. And the Lamanites take over the people. And Limhi is one of Noah's sons. And so he kind of becomes the new leader because um, Noah has ab- abandoned them all. And they had sworn in their hearts, it says in 19, the people out with Noah, that they would return to the land of Nephi. And if their wives and their children were slain and also those with Terry, they would seek revenge. And the king says, don't go back. And, they're, and they, that's when they had that awakening moment. They're like, I cannot believe we have followed you. Look what we've done because we followed you. And, and finally, they have their turning moment, and they go back, and, and, Abinad, and Noah is burned, just like Abinadi prophesied, and, and they go back into that city. And now they are taken as slaves in chapter 19. The people of Limhi. Limhi is now Noah's son. Oh, I was about to look at my map. My map. Oh. <laughs> it's gone. It's far away. <laughs> Sorry, move on. Um, and now they are taken, um, they're taken over. And um, in, when you get into chapter 20, those priests um, that were with Noah, they actually escape. They don't get captured by the people and they are going to keep causing some problems. So I need to introduce those people to you, even though we want to forget them. They keep coming back into the story. But the priests and Noah, they're out in the forest and the people are like, no way, we're not following you anymore. And they grab Noah and tie him up and the priests get away. Well, back in two years have passed and Limhi and his people are living, giving 50% of everything they own to the Lamanites. They're in a terrible situation. We're going to talk about in just a second. In this terrible situation, and, um, 
the there are these Lamanite daughters. It says that like to go and and they bathe or who knows what's happening. This is it's a little scandalous. Everyone, we're about to turn up the rating. Okay, um, they like to dance with each other. I don't know why they were bathing. Yeah. In my mind. <laughs> like you I think actually, it's the cartoon. You made that more scandalous than it was. I think it was the cartoon. <laughs> and I was gonna let you figure that one out because. <laughs> Listen, I thought it was in the scriptures in my but in the cartoon, everybody. So You're thinking about a different story. David. You know those ones that you thought. <laughs> Anyways, so the those priests come and they kidnap those girls and they take them away. And um uh what was I? I'm still trying to find where where in my mind. <laughs> Yo, we need y'all to erase that from your from your memory. It's gotta be from the cartoon. I'm so distracted by this, but uh, um, okay, what's perfect. even happening? All right, so perfect. these priests take those women away into the into the forest, and then the Lamanites come and they attack the people of Limhi. Now. Here is this verse that I think teaches a really powerful lesson in verse six. It came to pass when the Lamanites found that their daughters had been missing, they were angry with the people of Limhi, for they thought it was the people of Limhi. And they come and they'd made a promise that they wouldn't attack the people of Limhi. As long as they paid 50% of their taxes, they would leave them at B and they wouldn't attack. But they attacked. And I want to add on to that uh, another verse. Um, which is verse 13, and the king of the Lamanites says to um, Limhi, because Limhi's like, why did you do that? And he says, the king said, I have broken the oath because your people carried away the daughters of my people. Therefore, in my anger, I caused my people to come up to war against the Wait, what verse are you in? I'm so sorry. That is verse 15. So six has this line, they were angry with the people for they thought it was them. And 15, it says, I broke my oath because thy people did carry them away. And I want to say, I want to, I wrote in my margin, I underlined that phrase in verse six, they thought. And I, and, and I wrote in my margins, well, you were wrong. And in next to verse 15, you were wrong. You broke your oath on a, on a wrong assumption. And, and I think that that's important to like think about that how uh, like the power of our assumptions. Well, and it's super interesting because when I studied this, I was thinking the same thing. And then it's so interesting because Limhi's people do not do the same thing. When they have the chance to just destroy the king, they're so mad at him. Um, they don't do that at all. In verse 13, they actually bind up his wounds, mm. which is not something you want to do to your enemy. But then it's even more interesting because then they start talking and they're like, why did you do this? What happened here? Right. This is a disaster. Right. And then they listen for like 10 verses. And then what happens after is they say, let us go forth to meet my people without arms. The king does. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden by verse 26, the people are having compassion for each other. And I think it's so interesting that the story is still really messy and it doesn't solve everything and right. not everything is just going to be totally fine after that. But I do think that there's a lesson there when we're interacting. Enemies is such a harsh word and for them that felt very right. But for us, maybe with people that we don't understand or people that we tend to fight with or argue with, I love the pattern that that relationship shows even on just one page because it's messier than just one page as usually life is. But I love the thought of bind up their wounds and listen to them. Without arms. Without arms. Yeah. And then have compassion. Right. If you do not pause and hear someone's story, you might act unjustly. Yeah. You might do something you regret. Right. And you might break, you know, your oaths, your promises that you've made on a bad assumption. Mm -hmm. Right. Just stop. Wait 10 verses. Lay down your arms. Bind up their wounds as one of your first moves, you know, make the first move of kindness. And so there really is a powerful lesson. Because how differently would you treat people if you just knew their story? Right, right. Because look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's such a powerful lesson. There's one more in there that I really um, am just so inclined to is in chapter 20. When the Lamanites do attack the people of Limhi, it says in verse 10, it came to pass that the battle became exceedingly sore for they fought like lions for their prey. 
And it came to pass that the people of Limhi began to drive the Lamanites before them, yet they were not half so numerous as the Lamanites. But they fought for their lives, for their wives, for their children. Therefore, they exerted themselves, and like dragons did they fight. They were half the size of that army, but they pushed that army back, and it's because they were fighting for a cause. It makes me think of that story of little David going into the battlefield of of Elah, and there was the giant, Goliath. And David says to his brother, when no one's fighting back, because they're like, we're outnumbered, we're outsized, we're outarmored. David asks this question, but is there not a cause? Don't we have something worth fighting for? And I think it's important to find a cause, to find a purpose what is it that what what is what is it I have in my life that I'm fighting for? Do I have like a you know something some good I'm trying to bring about? And when we have that, we can be outnumbered, we can be outsized, but we have we have that heart and that courage that comes from a purpose and a cause to what it is that we're doing. Mm. And and I I think about Jesus, you know, who walks into Gethsemane and feels outmatched with the weight of what he's about to approach. And, and, and he falls on his face and he cries for some other way. But yet, like the book of Hebrews says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He had a cause and that cause was you and that cause was me. And it gave him the courage and it gave him the bravery to fight until he was victorious. Mm. Okay, so the next section is going to be chapter 21 and 22. And this is when we really get Limhi's story, the people's story. And we've heard glimpses of it of quite a few chapters before. But this is when we really get the details because what happens is Limhi returns. And this is, let's just say, this is where we're going to get the two different stories of of deliverance, right? Yes, this so, is the first, This is the start. Yeah. True. Should we show this right now? Oh, we'll- yeah. Go back to my... Oh, okay, the chart. Okay. This? Okay, no, sure. no, it's fine. We're okay, going to show your this. map. You love your no, map. We're gonna, okay, so here's the worksheet for the week. This is already filled out, so just pretend you can't read it. It's fine. You can just have a cheat. But we're going to have first the people of Limhi, who are just stayed there and got taken captive by the Lamanites. And then after that, we're going to hear the deliverance story of the people of Alma. So the worksheet, A Tale of Two Cities, is a chance to look at three different things from each story. Both of those stories. So the, remember the beginning we said, the God will deliver us in different ways. And so it's neat, this little study to see what does he do for each of these And side by side, I think yeah. is really powerful. Yeah. So what happens is the people of Limhi begin to live in peace for just a second. But what happens is the Lamanites get a little bit worried about it and a little bit angry with them. And then they come in and this is when the trouble starts. And in verse number three, you can start to see what happens. And they smite them on their cheeks and they exercise authority over them and they put heavy burdens on their backs and they just control them. And they decide to step in and be the boss over Limhi's people. And not a very nice boss at all. And um, you see already in verse 5 that the afflictions of the Nephites were great. And there was no way that they could deliver themselves out of their hands. They had no chance. They were not strong enough on their own. But what happens is the people, Limhi's people, start saying, we're sick of this. We cannot do this anymore. And even though they were not strong enough on their own, they kept talking to Limhi and just said, please, let us, this is too hard for us. At least let us try to get out of this situation. And finally, Limhi's like, okay, try then. Go ahead. If you want to try, try. And so they try once. And what happens is the Lamanites just absolutely destroy them. And they slay a ton of them. Just destroy so many of them. And... This is their first try, and in verse number nine, already you see the devastation. And now there was a great mourning and lamentation among the people of Limhi, the widow mourning for her husband, the son and the daughter mourning for their father, and the brothers for their brethren. Everybody lost somebody in the fight. Everybody. Everybody was mourning. Everybody was hurting. And then what happens is, this is the saddest verse of all time, so we just have to read it because it's just going to break your heart. There were a great many widows in the land, and they did cry mightily from day to day because they were so afraid. Mm. And if you are living like that, it's no wonder that you try again. Because if you're the kids of those moms 
Or if you're the oldest son in that house and you hear your mother crying every single day, no wonder that you wouldn't wake up one day and say, we have to try again because I can't live like this. I can't live with the fact that my mother is waking up every single day sobbing because she is so afraid because her husband was destroyed by them. And so what happens is they try again. And they say, no, let's try to stand up to the Lamanites again. And it doesn't work. And more of them are lost. And then they try a third time and it doesn't work. And more of them are lost. And that feels like some battles that we face. That even though in the beginning we might have said, I'm not strong enough on this, on my own for this. You tried anyways. And then you tried again and you tried again. And it seemed to only make things worse. Yeah. It's almost as if like they try in frustration, then they try in revenge then they try in sadness and you're just like, sometimes those are the emotions that drive us into a decision. Yes. My anger, my frustration, my sadness can drive me into one. And it didn't, it, it didn't turn out. And, and I think too, it, it's worth pointing out that I think you'll see yourself in that first column of chapter 21 and there's words. Some of you might be carrying heavy burdens. Some of you might feel surrounded. Some of you might be thinking there's no way out of this. And if that's so, if you feel like you're in a battle, if you feel like you're in a place of loss, in a place of mourning, then then what they learn next is is your lesson. Mm. And this is just that, that's the first box on the worksheet. Heavy burdens, afflictions, great fear, no way surrounded. You have read those words in the first half of chapter 21, and you can fill out whichever ones you want. You're going to go through, and there's going to be certain ones, I think, that will hit your heart harder than others. And just write those in that box. That's their need. They were in a really tough place. And what happens is they decide that they're like, okay, we just have to, we just have to, we can't. We can't do this on our own. So they humble themselves, and they just start praying. And they just start crying. And they say, please, God, deliver us from our afflictions. Please, please, please. And then what happens is that the Lord does hear their cries. That's verse number 15. And he begins to soften the hearts of the Lamanites. And they began to ease their burdens. Yet the Lord did not see fit to deliver them out of bondage. That did not come immediately for these people. The deliverance did not happen instantly when they began to pray. But what happens in verse 16 is so interesting. Well, and can I point out one thing that's really interesting right there is that right there in that same verse, you want to mark the Lord did hear their cries, mm. yet the Lord did not see fit to deliver them out of bondage. And, and sometimes we make those opposites of each other. But He has to be doing either one or the other. Right. Yes. And in this verse, we learn that while he's not yet delivering you, he is still hearing your cries. And I think that's a really powerful lesson to learn about the heart of God. Mm, beautiful. And then what we have written in for the middle, what the middle looks like is from verse number 16. And it came to pass that they began to prosper by degrees in the land. That little by little, degree by degree, they began to find prosperity. Mm. And I think that more often or not, we find that in the middle of our afflictions, that God will help us pros prosper degree by degree. And I think that's the beginning of deliverance, but I think that does start in the middle. Mm -hmm. That he says, listen, before the big deliverance comes, I will give you little by little until it feels like deliverance. And it's so interesting because last week was a super, super tough week for me. And um, we got some pretty rough news and it really broke my heart. And what happened is the first few days just felt absolutely terrible. But then like day four and day five, I would wake up and I would want to have a good day, but I just felt like I couldn't. Like it was just no matter what, there's just things weighing on my heart. And I got done with work earlier this week and I um, went home and I just wanted to lay on my bed and my room was dark and I closed all the blinds and I laid on my bed and I just... Um, heard the spirit say, turn on the light. And I said, okay, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but I'll try it. And I just turned on the light. And then once I got up to turn on the light, I just looked at my blinds and I was like, oh, well, it's sunny. I might as well open my blinds. And then when I was opening my blinds, I saw my little, I have like a little tape player. And I was like, oh, I'll just put on my favorite tape. That's perfect. And I put my tape in. And then I looked at my room and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a disaster. I might as well just clean this room. And then I cleaned my room. And by the time I was cleaning my room, I looked around and I said, I'm feeling better actually. Mm, mm. I feel better. And I think that maybe sometimes that's how he helps us prosper by degrees. As he says, turn on the light and open up the blinds and do it one tiny thing at a time. And deliverance is promised in the end. 
But maybe step one is just turning on the light. Yeah. And and I and that's that's so sweet and so powerful. And I want to add on to that verse 18 where it says, Now the people of Limhi kept together in a body as much as it was possible. Hmm. They just did whatever it is that they could. And sometimes that only is opening up the blinds or turning on the light. And just God coming in just a little bit of a time. He hears us and and maybe they weren't ready for the deliverance or or for the answer. Or, or whatever it was. Like the God has a purpose in his timing. We hear that again and again and again, and we believe it in other people's stories. And I think this chapter is a call for us to believe it in our own stories as well. Because this is why you love timeline so much, everybody. And it's because of this. It's <laughs> all the timeline. <laughs> Two things happen as part of their deliverance. Um, soon after that, Ammon shows up. And you remember two, three lessons ago, Ammon gets sent away. And he comes down into the land with them and they all arrest him. And because they think he's one of the priests of Noah. So that's where all the stories collide. They're like, oh my gosh, we thought you were him. And that's why he gets arrested. And, and then they find out who he is and they realize, oh my goodness, you are here to set us free. Now, what I want you to know is that when you see that timeline in your mind, right? Where you have the top timeline happening and the bottom timeline. While they were praying for that deliverance, Ammon was already on the way. He spent 40 days looking for him in the wilderness. They camped in this place and on the hill and they went in and then they were in jail. And remember all those things. So the whole time they were praying and some may have been tempted to say, God's not hearing our cries because he's not doing anything about it. Meanwhile, he was doing something about it. He was already on the move. And I think that as we sit in a place of waiting, while we're being prospered by degrees, we need to remember that God is on the move. Our deliverance story is already in motion. And I love that he might not save you right away, but someone is on their way. Yeah, so God, that's what I rewrote on this worksheet for what it looked like is God sent help. They Mm -hmm. tried to do it by themselves. And God was like, that's not how it's going to work. I'm sending someone to help you. And then they counsel together in chapter 22 and they come up with this way. And it's awesome that it's like Ammon's there with an idea. Limhi's there with an idea. Gideon's there with an idea. And all together. They They really did need each other. Yeah, they needed each other. The deliverance couldn't happen until Gideon got his courage and Ammon showed up. And Limhi had learned whatever lessons he needed to. And once all three of those came together, then the deliverance could happen, and it does, at the end of 22. Beautiful. All righty. The last two chapters are going to be Alma's story. So you remember Alma and his little tiny group broke off from the waters of Mormon. They had to run away because they were getting found, and so they disappeared. They're living in the wilderness. This is their story, starting in chapter 23. Yeah, you might just remember, this is just camera one, camera two the entire time. Right? Yeah, it's, like, it's going all over Alma's the place. Alma's people, Limhi's people. Now back to Alma's people. It's a good movie, at least. It's a great it's movie. A good movie. And so what happens is they Be careful when start... you watch the movie. You might get... <laughs> you might, <laughs> might, might show you scenes there. That... And that's true. <laughs> and what happens is um, Alma's people are in the middle of the wilderness... And they decide to start building up their people. And they're like, okay, here we go. We're building our kingdom. Let's do this. And it's so tender because what happens is they say, we want a king. And Alma says, uh, I don't think we want a king. And you forgot. And they love Alma. And so they're like, Alma, perfect. You're just going to be our king. This is how we're going to set up our kingdom. And he says, no, no, no. We're not doing that because one of us isn't better than the other of us. In this kingdom, we are all just doing our best. And we've seen where that goes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's been a disaster. And he says, and I've been caught up in that. And I know. And I know that. And I know that we're not doing that. So we're going to move on. And so what happens is they just start building up their land. And he says, we're all just going to love each other. And it's going to be a good place. And it feels so happy. Like you're just like, okay, perfect. It's the best land ever. Right. Everyone's so happy. Right. And they began to prosper exceedingly. Um, And then what happens is it starts to fall apart. And before any of it falls apart, I think the scriptures are so interesting because he gives you a little spoiler alert in number 21 through 24, verse 21 through 24 of chapter 23. And it says that um, their patience is going to be tried and their faith. But then he says, nevertheless, Whosoever putteth his trust in him, the same shall be lifted up at the last day. Yea, and thus it was with this 
people, that they were brought into bondage and none could deliver them but the Lord their God, even the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And it came to pass that he did deliver him and he did show forth his mighty power unto them and great were their rejoicings. And it's so interesting because you get the end of their story before you even know what's about to happen. They're living good and peacefully in the land and you're like, wait, why are you telling me this right now? But I think it's so interesting because when you read those verses, you have an expectation for what their deliverance is going to look like. Yeah. That God delivers big and he delivers like he parts seas and he slays giants and he does things that no one else can do. And you start getting built up into this idea that their deliverance is going to be magnificent and big and look for that God in this story. And it's so interesting because what happens in their story is it doesn't really look like a lot of other stories that you are super familiar with or super well told, well told. And I think that might be why he starts out with that is because I think he wants to say, this story might not seem like a God of deliverance, but I promise you it is there. So look for him, even though he might look different than you expected him to look like. Mm. And so what happens is they're living peacefully. And then all of a sudden, one day, an army of Lamanites surrounds them. They're hiding in a field. They're trying to figure it out. They're so, so scared. And they're like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to go talk to them. We're going to figure this out. We're afraid. We're just going to surrender. We don't have a lot going for us, so let's just surrender. They go talk to the Lamanites. The Lamanites kind of trick them. It's a really messy conversation. The Lamanites ended up tricking them, and they say, okay, here's how this is going to go. The Lamanites also, I forgot about this, found, remember the priests that we talked about? They, the Lamanites found the priests first, and they got the priests, and they brought them and took them with them, and now they found Alma's people. When they got to Alma's people, they were like, listen, we're trying to find the land of Nephi. Is that true? The land of Nephi? Yeah. Yeah. In yeah, verse yeah. 35. And they said, we're trying to find this. Tell us where it is. And then we'll let you go free. You're going to be fine. And they say, okay, perfect. And so they tell them, hoping that that's going to let them be free. Um, but what happens is not that. Then all of a sudden they say, okay, well, here's this guy, Amulon. He's one of the priests. He's familiar. He's one of your type of people. You've known him before. So we're going to send him. He's going to be in charge of you. We're still going to take you over. Thanks for telling us where to go. We're going to go. We're going to leave him. And that's going to be that. And, um, and then all of a sudden, not even because they did anything wrong, really, it seems, but just because they tried their best, they still ended up in captivity. And the Lamanites start ruling over them. And Amulon doesn't start out with a lot of power, but he becomes really good friends with the king of the Lamanites. And then all of a sudden he's in charge of them. And um, once he gets in charge of them, he starts to really be pretty harsh. And that's, this is the second one of the cities. So what happens is he goes through and you'll see in number verse number nine of chapter 24 that um, he's going to start putting tasks upon them and taskmasters and he's going to turn them into slaves and bring them into captivity. And what happens is it's really harsh. He is a really, really harsh guy. And their afflictions begin to be so great that they cry mightily to God. They say, we need to be saved. We're in trouble. And we are trying to be good people. And we tried to build your kingdom. And we have fallen into captivity. And we need help. Please, God, help us. And Amulon finds out. And he's like, listen, we're done with that. You're not praying anymore because I don't know what's going to happen when you pray. And so we're done with that. I'm not messing with that. I'm not getting involved in that. You are done. And um, Alma's people knew that wasn't the end of their story. And they were not going to go down without a fight, whether that fight be loud or quiet. And um, in verse number 12, it says, And his people did not raise their voices to the Lord their God, but did pour out their hearts to him. And um, he did know the thoughts of their hearts. Mm. And when their mouths had to be quiet, their hearts could be loud. And they said, we are not going to cry loudly anymore, but we will give our hearts to you. And we will tell you all of the time. And what happens is that's when the deliverance starts. So that part is pour out their hearts. And then this is the second part of the middle, because what happens is the Lord answers back and says, lift up your heads and be of good comfort. For I know of the covenant which you have made unto me, and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage. Which is such a beautiful and powerful verse to describe the kind of confidence a person can live in covenant relationship with God. Yeah. If you are not sure what to cherish about your covenants, you read verse 13 over and over and over again, and you will be reminded 
that covenants aren't a task to accomplish or things that you need to do, but rather covenants are a relationship and a promise with someone who is divine. And and you've said this before, which I love, that you're like, a lot of times we talk about in our covenants, the promises we've made to God, but let's not forget the more powerful and important part of a covenant are the promises that God has made to us. That he will show up for you. Right. He promises. And it's so interesting because when you hear that, you start imagining the type of deliverance that he's going to bring. And you expect the Red Sea and Goliath falling and that God to show up. And what happens instead, well, actually he does show up, but he does it a little differently for them. And I will also ease the burdens which are upon your shoulders and you will not be able to fill them upon your backs. And even though you will still be in bondage, I will do this so you stand as witnesses for me hereafter and that you may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. The affliction is not going to disappear, but you can bet by the end of it, you will be positive that I was in the middle of the affliction with yeah, you. Yeah, right. That I showed up for you, that I was there. And that really does happen for these people and their burdens are made light and they start being able to do the things with ease and they are submitting cheerfully with patience to the will of the Lord. And they say, okay, you have made this feel lighter for us. And though we are still in captivity, you have made the outcome seem possible. You have made this even seem like a life of a disciple. And then that we can make it through the middle, right? Yes. Give us the strength to make it through. The, 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 the end is promised, but the middle is easier yeah. because of him. Right. And what happens is then the cutest verse of all time, the Lord comes to them and says, be of good comfort. For tomorrow, I will deliver you out of bondage. And I love that they didn't exactly know how that was going to look. They had no idea. And they just said, we just have to be ready. So they got all of their stuff ready and they just gathered everything together. And in the morning, they just waited to see what would happen. And all the Lamanites stayed asleep and they had a deep sleep and they got all of their stuff that they had prepared and they got out. And I love that for them, God just opened the door. And said, look, I'm going to give you an opportunity and it is going to just take care of this. All you have to do is show up and I will show up for you, even if it didn't come in the time that you thought it was going to. And I think that's a verse that everybody can expect to hear, um, a promise that everyone expect, can expect to hear from the Lord sometime in their life. I'm not sure when it will happen, but there is coming a day for everyone listening when God will say, be of good comfort for on the morrow, I will deliver you out of bondage. And that is our little tender mercy for the week, is Mosiah 23, 27. And Alma went forth and stood among them and exhorted them that they should not be frightened, but they should remember the Lord their God, and he would deliver them. That is true for both cities. That is true for our lives today. And it might look different. One city to the next, one person to the next. But the God is the same and the deliverance is promised. Amen. All right, we will see you next week.